it's a great pleasure to, to be here at Google to talk about our, uh, our research and uh, uh, let you know all the great things that we have going on. And, um, and uh, thanks for uh, the, the, um, the, the support that, that uh, um, Google Giving uh, uh, provides for organizations like ours. Um, so we are a, a nonprofit uh, research foundation that uh, does research into, into aging. And um, to, to sort of start you out with our concept of how we think about aging uh, and how it impacts disease, um, the traditional way that, uh, that people, um, that medicine thinks about intervening with aging uh, is, uh, is attacking the pathology. So uh, you've got a disease, uh, a heart disease or uh, cancer, and you know, you've got a cancer. What is cancer? It's you know, too many cells in a tumor. So you've got to get rid of the tumor. So we're going to uh, zap the, the you're going to cut out the tumor, zap it somehow. Um, that's that's a pathology approach to uh, to dealing with a disease of aging. Uh, it's been kind of hip lately to uh, to go back to the beginning and look at metabolism. So that so the sort of the root cause of all aging is the byproducts of metabolism. And so there's all kinds of cool genetic tricks you can do in uh, in animals in model systems where you can genetically manipulate them and slow down their aging you know 10 20 even 100% uh, in some model systems and you know maybe you'll get a, a doubling of the, of the lifespan of a, uh, of a of a microscopic worm uh, or uh, or a fruit fly <clears throat> and you know and that and that works on up uh, into mice uh, but people are looking at trying to intervene at that level and saying, is there a way that we can drug some of these pathways and see if we can slow down the aging process a little bit? Uh, and that's a fine approach, but uh, our preferred uh, method is to intervene at the level of where the damage is accumulating as a result of metabolism as a way to treat pathology by either uh, reversing or preventing damage that causes the pathology. Uh, to step back for a moment and, uh, and, and, and talk about what our foundation does in the big picture, uh, we, we organize outreach events. Uh, we do some uh, interaction trying to get uh, policy changes, uh, say, at the uh, FDA and such like that. And, and most of that uh, is focused in on different um, conferences that we organize. The last three years, we've been organizing uh, a series called the Rejuvenation Biotechnology uh, Conference in the, here in the Bay Area, uh, which is focused on trying to nucleate a uh, rejuvenation biotechnology community uh, around uh, companies and uh, academia, nonprofit research, uh, trying to build this, uh, this industry. Um, Another aspect of our, uh, of our work, uh, non-research work, is our educational mission. Uh, we, the, the main aspect of our educational mission is our summer internship program. And uh, that's where we, uh, we screen hundreds of applicants. It's a very competitive process. And we get uh, some of the best and brightest um, undergraduate uh, students in the, in the country who are focused on uh, biology, biomedical, uh, uh, research and bring them into our labs uh, here in, uh, in Mountain View or uh, distributing around the country to affiliated labs where uh, they'll, they'll work on a project that, um, that, that uh, you know, has some interaction with our mission and then uh, they also you know, learn about our, our philosophy and our, our process and the way that, that we are trying to tackle the diseases and disabilities of aging, and then hopefully going out into the into the world and uh, and being advocates uh, on our behalf. Uh, and then, uh, along with our uh, educational mission, we produce uh, videos. You can go to our website and see uh, educational videos about um, you know lectures about uh, the the biology of aging and uh, and some of our approaches to to tackle it. Uh, there's a bunch of celebrities that have uh, endorsed us. Um, and uh, uh, it's great to have their support, and, uh, uh, and they help us with, uh, with fundraising, uh, as well as, uh, as a, a world-class scientists on our research advisory board. 
um, you know, people who uh, we will convene to, to advise us on, uh, on our science and our, and our approaches. So this is a little bit of an, uh, of an old slide, but it, uh, it, it tells the, uh, the right picture, which is that, um, you know, overall U.S. healthcare spending is just ballooning. Uh, the slide's a few years old, so um, the, the $1.2 trillion number is probably a little low. Uh, and the, uh, the National Institutes of Health are the, the main funders of biological research, uh, certainly biomedical research in this country, uh, and they spend a bit over $30 billion a year on research. The National Institute on Aging uh, has, uh, a, is a, a piece of uh, that NIH pie, uh, and their budget's a little over a billion dollars. Um, their actual expenditures on stuff that we consider um, relevant to damage repair as a means of tackling the pathology of aging uh, is somewhere down in the low double digit millions of dollars per year, uh, which brings it down comparable to uh, our budget, which uh, 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 depending on how well fundraising is going, uh, that particular year is uh, somewhere in the three to five million dollars uh, a year. So um, that's, that's kind of a, a, a picture of, you know, that, that we're actually having, we think, a, a fairly uh, substantial impact on, uh, on the basic research in this, uh, in this field, but also how far there is to go uh, in terms of stimulating uh, research uh, in, uh, in this um, area. So we, uh, we have, in our research per, um, uh, aspect, which is the main aspect of, of what we do at SRF, uh, we have research at our research center, which I'll tell you a lot more about uh, in a few moments, uh, but we also fund external research. So sometimes we go out and we have you know, a project that we want to tackle. Say we want to tackle uh, the damage that's caused by uh, glucose floating around in your bloodstream. We'll go out and find the best researcher in, uh, in academia or industry, and we will fund a, a project, uh, usually a, a pilot project, to try to um, get some energy started in that, uh, uh, in that area that can uh, eventually develop into something that can be therapeutic. So these are some of the topics that we've, uh, that we've funded uh, over, over the years, and they, they cover some of the, a lot of the different um, categories of damage that we, uh, that, that we associate with aging. So, you know, cell loss and, and cell uh, atrophy, you know, when your cells get old, they stop dividing, you can't replace the cells that you have. Uh, that's when you start talking about uh, stem cell uh, therapies. Uh, when um, you're looking at uh, stuff in the extracellular uh, matrix, which is the space between your cells, uh, that can uh, stiffen up with, with age and uh, we're looking at ways to try to clean that up. Here's an example of that kind of research. Uh, that I'm just going to touch on that's uh, been really quite successful in, uh, in recent years. And our, uh, our researcher, uh, David Spiegel, is a professor at Yale that we uh, have been funding on this project. Uh, it was known that a, a certain kind of glucose crosslink, so glucose is a molecule that everybody here is familiar with, right? It's a, it's a unit of energy uh, that, our, that our body uses to, to transport energy through the bloodstream. It's also a fairly reactive molecule, and so it can react with say your, uh, the walls of your, your arteries and cause them to stiffen up with age because we always have, whether or not you have diabetes, which is just a little bit too much glucose floating around your bloodstream or the normal amount, you still have glucose floating around your bloodstream and it's gonna react with, uh, uh, with anything that it touches. Slowly over time, those uh, reactions build up and eventually you get stiffening of the arteries, you get uh, diabetic neuropathy, um, uh, and uh, uh, associated uh, effects of aging along those lines. So what, uh, what David was uh, able to do was synthesize one of the main chemical crosslinks that form synthetically in the lab. And now we're working at figuring out ways to break those, uh, those crosslinks to, to both diagnose, uh, detect them in, uh, in the body and, uh, and break them. And uh, another mission of ours, like I was saying before, is to try to stimulate a, uh, an industry here. And so here are a few companies that have spun out of our uh, technologies that we've developed at, uh, uh, at SENS Research Foundation. 
uh, ICOR where um, they are working on uh, therapy for um, a macular degeneration based on some uh, enzyme therapy research that we uh, did in our lab. Uh, Ocean, uh, which is uh, a competitor of Unity that you may have seen in the news recently, uh, raising an awful lot of money to try to kill senescent cells. Senescent cells being cells that accumulate with aging and then just sit there and don't go away uh, and uh, gum up the works. Uh, and uh, Aragos and uh, um, uh, HRB that are, are working on uh, uh, cryonics and the uh, um, atherosclerosis uh, therapy. Uh, and so, uh, like I said, we, our headquarters is here uh, on the other side of, uh, of Mountain View from, uh, from Google headquarters, and uh, it's much smaller than, uh, than Google for now. Um, but uh, <laughs> we have a small, uh, a small lab uh, here in, uh, in Google that's been uh, open since uh, late 2010. And uh, we've been doing some, uh, some cool research uh, in-house there ever since. And uh, these are the three projects we have uh, going on there right now. Uh, the uh, Oncosense project is a cancer project that uh, targets uh, telomeres, which are the ends of your chromosomes, that shorten uh, with every cell division. And they're important to keep long for cancer cells to be able to survive. And uh, that's headed up by Geraldo Silva, who's here with me today, and you can uh, ask him questions about it later if, uh, uh, if you're interested. Um, but he's developed some really cool technology for um, being able to detect how it is that uh, certain kinds of cancers are, uh, are doing that, and uh, we're, we're working on uh, trying to screen for ways to, uh, to kill those cancers. Um, we, uh, we have a small uh, uh, project on uh, screening for drugs that, uh, to get rid of the uh, really bad cholesterols, which are cholesterols caused by nation products of, uh, of cholesterol. Uh, and uh, that's a, a small project that we're, we're hoping to spin out into a, a small company uh, this year, uh, as well as perhaps the, uh, the, the cancer project. Uh, um, maybe we'll have some exciting news on those uh, two projects uh, in the coming year. Uh, and then finally, the mitochondria project, uh, which is uh, one of our older projects that we've had going for a while that we've recently had some really cool success that I'm going to dive into uh, a bit more deeply here. And uh, most of the work that I'll tell you about uh, in the mitochondria, most of the stuff that I'm going to show you is, uh, was performed by uh, uh, Dr. Umutha Buminathan, who's here with me today, uh, who will um, uh, answer any questions that, uh, uh, that, uh, that I can't answer. So the, uh, uh, the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the, uh, of the cell. It's, uh, it's, it's an organelle that lives inside your cell. Uh, you've got hundreds or in some cases over, in some cells over a thousand of these mitochondria floating around your cell and they generate most of your energy and they do it in an extremely efficient way. Um, the mitochondria are really weird and interesting in that they have their own DNA and this is the only place that you find DNA that's not in the nucleus of your cell, in the main, what we usually think of as the genome that we inherit uh, from our parents, one copy from mom and one copy from dad, uh, the, the mitochondria is, uh, is, is totally different. It has its own DNA. It's a very small circular DNA, and you only inherit it from mom. Um, this, is a, this is a problem for aging because uh, when you generate power, say at a coal-fired power plant, you generate a bunch of pollution, right? And the same thing happens when you generate energy inside the mitochondria. You, uh, you generate uh, byproducts, which are called free radicals, and free radicals are very reactive to DNA. And so uh, this isn't a great uh, combination that evolution has come up with uh, of putting these, these two things right next to each other. It's a, it's a little bit of a, a leftover of... Uh, uh, evolutionary history uh, that, that is responsible for this. So uh, what we are, are trying to do is figure out ways to, um, to replace these genes when they go bad uh, using a gene therapy approach. So um, I, I want to say a couple of words to convince you of the feasibility of this project. Uh, people say, what, you're going to try to you know, fix or replace an entire genome? Well, it's a really tiny genome. Uh, it's only uh, about 16,000 bases long. And for, um, for comparison, there's uh, 3 billion bases in uh, each 
uh, uh, each copy of your nuclear genome. So uh, it, it, uh, it's tiny in comparison to your, uh, to your nuclear genome. Uh, there's only 13 genes, protein coding genes, in, uh, in the mitochondria. Uh, they're all essential genes, uh, and uh, we're working on, on all of them. But the, uh, the nucleus, where the rest of your genes are kept, they code somewhere 1,000 to 1,500 genes that help regulate the mitochondria as well. So it's a tiny minority of the, uh, the genes that regulate your mitochondria that are still stored inside of the mitochondria. And then the last thing uh, that, that I want to remind you about is that uh, about the, the mitochondrial genetics is that um, there's uh, that the mitochondria speaks a slightly different language. I, I like to call it a dialect than your nucleus uh, than, the, than the nucleus does. So the A, T, C's, and G's that make up your entire uh, DNA um, uh, world are um, coded. They they code a slightly different um, um, amino acid. Uh, um, language in the mitochondria than they do in the in the nucleus. Uh, so just hold on to that little bit of trivia for for a moment. Uh, so these are the thirteen uh, genes and um, the the role that kind of the, the place that they are in the mitochondria. So this is this is zoomed in uh, of uh, one part of the mitochondria where all the energy is being made. And all 13 of these genes that are inside of the mitochondria, they take part directly in the energy generation process. And so these are the, the ones that we're working on. The last two there, ATP6 and ATP8, are the ones I'm going to talk about today. And they are essential for the actual end of the energy, uh, energy generation process, the creation of ATP. Uh, which is the, the currency of energy in your cells and how, um, what, uh, how biochemically, uh, 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 biochemical reactions happen in your, uh, in your cells is, is from uh, ATP as the providing energy to chemical reactions. <clears throat> so um, to, to tackle this problem a, a few years ago, uh, Amutha and I put our heads together and, you know, we've been working on this for several years already and kind of having intermittent progress and looking at other people in the field and looking at their intermittent progress and saying, we need to do something different here. And so we went looking for some cells that, that totally, that didn't just have a few mutations and a few copies of their mitochondrial uh, DNA that might be affecting aging or might be affecting a patient in a complicated way uh, that's, that's difficult to, to pin down uh, in the lab. We went looking for some extremely rare patients that have extremely severe mutations in the mitochondrial DNA and particularly ones that have mutations that would completely destroy uh, the activity of one or more of those 13 genes in a way that we could pin down something very specific to work on. So we found a, uh, uh, some cells from a patient that were published in the literature that had a very rare mutation in ATP8 that totally shut down uh, ATP8 uh, activity and then totally shut down the um, function of the ATPase, which makes all of your energy. So of course, this uh, um, young person was very sick uh, and um, a researcher collected cells for, um, uh, for, uh, for further study, and we got a hold of those cells and um, did a, uh, an awful lot of work uh, to make them um, perfectly clean and mutant uh, so that we could study them. And so I'll, I'll try not to spend too much time on these uh, blots which show uh, proteins and uh, uh, where they are and such like that. But if you see the arrow on the left, it shows in normal cells where that protein is. And then on the right, um, just next to it, there's nothing there, which means that uh, it has none of that protein. Um, and then we were surprised to find, looking over on the right side, where you see ATP6, that, um, that the mutation that affected one also indirectly affected the other. Uh, and I won't, I won't go into the nitty gritty of why that happened. It took us a while to figure it all out. But we ended up having a cell line that um, uh, that was deficient in uh, not one, but two genes. But we thought we could tackle this problem. Uh, and uh, if we could, then it would actually be uh, kind of twice as cool as, uh, as, a, um, uh, as a project where we only solved one of them. So um, 
looking at this uh, cartoon uh, uh, in, the, in the middle there that has the, the, the picture of the ATP6 and the ATP8 genes, this is kind of how we engineered them. We uh, first on the, on the left, it says the G1 MTS, we took a mitochondrial targeting sequence from a different gene that, we, uh, that it was known from the literature uh, is used for one of those other thousand genes that's normally in the nucleus. And we took that and we stuck it on the front of, uh, of our genes. And this is actually, we, we've, we've done trial and error with a lot of different versions of these. Uh, and this one, we, we found a few that work really well. So we found one that worked really well and we stuck it in front of the DNA for our two genes. Then we had to recode our genes to make them speak the nuclear language again. So they were speaking the mitochondrial language. So now we recoded them so that they speak the nuclear language. And then we uh, stuck on the, uh, on the end of them a, um, a tag, a flag, if you will, that we could use to detect them uh, inside of the, uh, of the cells. Uh, and over there on the right, you can see them. Um, there's kind of a progression here of, uh, of, of uh, a little bit of an example of some of the trial and error that we went through uh, to, get the, to get it working uh, temporarily uh, in cells and then eventually permanently and getting it into the mitochondria, and, it, and so it stays there long term. Uh, and so that was all successful, and we were able to, to also get it into these rather fragile and sickly mutant cells. Um, and we could do it simultaneously with both the ATP6 and the ATP8 genes, uh, and it's, so it's kind of like a gene therapy that we're doing in the cells. We can put this into viruses that, uh, um, that, you, can put, that you can infect cells with, and, uh, and get them to uh, either temporarily or stably uh, express uh, express these uh, um, these genes. So uh, just one more of uh, uh, of these these blots, uh, and then I'll show you uh, how the cells are are doing. Uh, this uh, I'm just going to ask you to take my word for it. This kind of blot uh, basically shows in um, that second panel from the left those two uh, dark uh, lines there. Okay, I'm going to do it. I, I said I wasn't going to do. It. I'm going to run over to the board and point to them. That <laughs> <laughs> these two here, those show that uh, you're actually getting our protein that we can detect with the flag tag uh, into the mitochondria and into the right place in the mitochondria, and it's assembling into the ATPs. Uh, and then the next one, uh, next to that, in that third panel, when this, these are showing up here, but not in the mutant, that means it's reassembling uh, completely in the uh, in, in the mitochondria uh, that that um, protein complex is reassembling. So now you have uh, an ATPase there. So here's some more data. Um, uh, the, the, the light up front is, uh, is a little bright, but um, I don't know if you can see in the, uh, the middle two uh, columns uh, at, the, um, at the bottom, on the top you have red um, that light up the mitochondria in cells. So you have maybe, I don't know, say 10 cells uh, on, the, uh, on the slide. And then all those red dots are where the mitochondria are. We stained them with a dye that lights up mitochondria. And then the green uh, on the, in the second row, that, those are the, um, the flag tag, which we've made fluorescent here. Uh, and you can see under the microscopy that the, um, uh, the ATP8 and the ATP6 uh, proteins are lighting up, and then if you can see the the yellow color in the on the bottom row in those uh, in those center two panels there, uh, the yellow means that they're they're co-localizing, they're going to the same place in the mitochondria. So what does this actually do for the cells? Are they um, are, are they are they happier? Are they um, are they healthier? Uh, so why why do we breathe? We breathe to make energy, and we make energy in our mitochondria. The oxygen that you breathe, eventually, it's, it's essentially its only function is to go inside your cells and go into your mitochondria and uh, take part in the energy generation process. So um, we can measure breathing in cells in the lab. We can stick an oxygen meter down into a Petri dish where some cells are growing and measure how much uh, oxygen they're consuming. Uh, um, and uh, this, is a, this graph is, uh, is a measurement of that. So the two lines at the bottom are the mutant cells that uh, have 
pretty much shut down their um, their energy generation process and uh, and therefore their respiration. And so these cells are are basically not breathing at all. Um, when you uh, look up to the three lines uh, up above, the red line at the top, those are normal wild type cells, and uh, they breathe just fine. Uh, and the, that, that first row, we, we do different things with drugs to, um, they're, they're, the first row is uh, the first set uh, before the oligomycin comes in, you can see that at the top, is with their basal respiration. And then that third uh, section there is where you can see their maximal respiration. And so uh, when you look at those second two lines there, the, the black and the orange, you can, you can see that the, the cells that we're rescuing, that we're putting back just ATP8 alone will get you up to, um, to, to orange and they're uh, doing pretty well. And then you put them both in together, the ATP8 and the ATP6, and they're, uh, they're, they're respiring quite well. So that's one um, really cool measurement of, uh, um, of mitochondrial function that we were able to show uh, almost complete recovery of in our, uh, in our rescued cells. Uh, and here is uh, another, there's, I don't know, a dozen or so different measures that, that we can do of this, and I'm just uh, going to show you uh, a couple of them. Um, here we're just growing cells, but we're growing cells and feeding them um, two different kinds of uh, food. And unfortunately, one picture is covering the, uh, the other. Usually this is a, a PowerPoint presentation where it's uh, animated on top of each other. So I apologize for that. So you can't see all the cells. Um, cells grown on glucose, they can survive the way that um, in a Petri dish, not really. Um, they can survive using only glucose to, um, to grow on. Uh, you know, or some other sugars, but uh, you know, glucose is a pretty universal sugar. So you can do uh, anaerobic or aerobic respiration, uh, and so they can survive um, with uh, you know doing uh, the uh, you know old-fashioned kind of uh, energy generation like bacteria do, and they can survive on glucose. However, if you grow them on galactose, which is a different kind of sugar, that can only be used for uh, aerobic respiration uh, in the mitochondria. And so if you have cells that can't do uh, uh, respiration in the mitochondria, that can't generate energy in the mitochondria, then they're going to totally die. Uh, and so if you look, um, you can't see the, the second panel, which, which has those, uh, uh, those, those cells, the mutant cells, uh, very well. But the last panel on the bottom, uh, there's, there's like no cells there, whereas there's hundreds of cells uh, on top when they're growing on uh, on glucose. However, when we put back uh, the uh, HP8 and the HP6, they can grow again. Uh, and, the, and the better illustration of that is the actual quantification, uh, which you can see on this graph. Uh, the, the cells that have um, no uh, 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 HP8 or HP6 in them, uh, they'll pretty much completely die in like five days on this, uh, on galactose. Uh, if you just put in ATP6 alone, uh, basically the same thing is happening. But if you put back in ATP8 with or without ATP6, then you'll get uh, much better survival. And then we can actually go much further than five days, and they can you know, slowly recover and continue growing fairly normally, uh, doing only um, aerobic respiration. Uh, so those uh, uh, two... Um, uh, th those, th those, those are two examples of how successful uh, we were at uh, completely um, uh, rejuvenating these cells, basically bringing cells that couldn't survive uh, under, under growth conditions that, that required them to be able to, um, to breathe. Um, we, we restored them completely with our, with our cellular gene therapy, if you will, uh, and, uh, and brought them back to life um, and, and close to normal function. So I'll just uh, I'll, I'll I'll wrap up uh, a little bit early here in in the next couple minutes, uh, and sort of talk about where uh, this kind of technology can go, uh, where we hope it will go, uh, and then I'll uh, take any questions that anybody might have. So we're uh, we're taking this particular gene therapy that that we developed for these cells, and we're going to try and put it into a mouse soon. Uh, and uh, Amitha is working on some proof of concept experiments for that in the in the lab right now. Um, 
trying to translate it into the uh, end of the mouse code, um, and we're, we're starting to get that working. Uh, we're also working on not just these two genes, but like I mentioned, all 13 of these genes. So sometimes, like I said, it sounds like an intractable problem, but it's only 13 genes, and we've already been uh, basically completely successful with one gene. Uh, the second gene to back it up uh, is working um, fairly well, and we're trying to improve it. And uh, we want to we want to create a technology that isn't necessarily that we need to customize one gene at a time, but a platform technology that will uh, that that will work for any of these uh, 13 genes. And so we're working on all kinds of tricks that I haven't. Uh, uh, had a chance to go over today to further engineer these uh, these genes and uh, and improve their uh, their targeting to the mitochondria. So we continue to uh, to work on that, uh, and we have projects on uh, the other uh, genes of the uh, mitochondrial family. And then, of course, the eventual goal is to get this into people. So. We're an aging research foundation, and uh, we're therefore interested in the mutations that occur randomly with, with aging. Uh, however, there's always uh, crossover in different fields, and so I'm studying not cells that have aged normally, but cells from a uh, patient that had a mutation in, in the mitochondria. And these patients are just really sick. I mean, you get a serious mutation in your mitochondrial DNA, you can't make energy properly. Uh, and uh, if, if you get born at all, oftentimes these, uh, these children are, are, are dying uh, you know, around the, the age of two um, or, or suffering for much longer. So the, the first gene therapies for, uh, for the mitochondria will uh, hopefully go into these patients. Um, and uh, you know, they can go one gene at a time. And then eventually, as we uh, improve the technology, uh, we hope to be able to use it to treat, say, uh, sarcopenia, the uh, um, uh, weakening of the muscles with, uh, with age. Um, so uh, just uh, wrap up here, and uh, we've got a great team of people at, uh, um, at SRF working on this, and great interns. Uh, all this work was that, that I just showed was uh, recently published. Uh, in uh, nucleic acids research, and uh, it was, uh, uh, I, I think it's been very well received. Uh, we collaborate with some uh, phenomenal researchers up at the uh, Buck Institute on, uh, on aging, and that's where they had that fancy piece of equipment that can measure the, uh, the breathing of the, of the cells uh, that I used uh, for, uh, uh, for this project. Uh, and um, I, I want to point out one uh, aspect of our funders. Usually, uh, it, it's uh, the, the most boring uh, topic on the slide, but I thought you all might be uh, interested in, uh, in in that from your, your Google Giving per, uh, perspective. Uh, SRF is just sort of the, the general, uh, all the um, people who donate uh, money to SRF General Fund, uh, and they give a lot of money to um, to the foundation. Uh, the Foster Foundation and Forever Healthy are uh, small family foundations where. A, uh, a wealthy family has has donated money to us uh, to, to do this project, um, and it's been extremely helpful. Uh, Lifespan.io, I thought, is something that would be uh, really interesting to all of you to check out. They're a crowdfunding site focused on funding science that is being done on uh, on aging, and particularly on uh, aging therapies or um, uh, aspects of uh, uh, you know, damage repair, reversing aspects of uh, the diseases of aging. And I, I think that they are doing some phenomenal work there uh, because they've, they've raised um, some really great money for us. And I, I, I'm not 100% uh, sure of this, but they might be the most successful crowd funders in, uh, in, in science uh, today. They, they, uh, uh, are, are really doing a great job. They're very small. They're only focusing on uh, on uh, one project at a time, uh, but they uh, they can raise uh, tens of thousands of dollars uh, for for single projects. Sort of more competitive with uh, you know sort of uh, the kind of successful uh, IT crowdfunding that uh, that you tend to see out there. Um, and then the Longevity uh, uh, Foundation, which uh, gave us a, a small grant a few years ago to to start this ATP8 project. So I'll, uh, I'll stop there and thank you all for your attention and the invitation to come talk and answer any questions that anybody might have. All right, I have a, a question. Yes. So in the sense research,
approach, there are seven things that have to be fixed to comprehensively end aging and restore old people to health, so full health of the young. Of the young. Um, <clears throat> So, and this is one of those seven things. Yes. So it's kind of a, 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 um, exciting to see it. It's actually working. Um, so suppose that only this is fixed, mm -hmm. and the other six things are that they, they take longer to to achieve. Would would that have an immediate effect? Uh, it's a great question, and it's a difficult question. So um, I, I didn't I didn't go into this in my introduction when I was talking about the the, the damage accumulation, but uh, we categories, uh, the, the damage into seven different categories of damage, mitochondrial mutations being one of them, uh, accumulation of senescent cells, I mentioned that uh, earlier is another, uh, those glucose crosslinks with another. So, you know, what if we just fix the, the mitochondria? Is that going to have an appreciable effect on, uh, on aging? Uh, and the, the, it, it's a complicated question. Uh, the, you know, the short answer is um, I don't know. Uh, the long answer is that it may have more of an effect in certain aspects of aging than others. It may not be expected to have a, a big effect on lifespan because you've got, you know, you, you fix this one, but you've got six other rate limiting aspects of damage that uh, are going to kill you if this doesn't. So, for example, by analogy, Let's say that you know you cured heart disease completely. We just like wiped heart disease off the map. That should just have an amazing effect on on aging, right? Because it's uh, was it the number one cause of uh, of death right now, heart disease, I think. Um, so you know you would think that that might you know, you know jump the uh, the human lifespan up by 10, 20 years. Uh, in fact, it, it wouldn't. I, I want to say it's something estimated like two years or something that we would get before something else would get you, before you'd uh, get hit by you know, cancer, Alzheimer's disease, something else that would kill you. So in that regard, I think it probably wouldn't jump up uh, the human lifespan a lot, but it might have effects on health span that could be quite dramatic. For example, in the skeletal muscle, which is all the muscle that we, that we use to you know, do everything in our daily lives, those might, uh, those are, thought to have a disproportionate um, reliance on mitochondria and be impacted by mitochondrial aging. And there's some experiments on mice that suggest that rejuvenating the mitochondria in old mice has really dramatic effects on their, uh, on their strength and endurance. So uh, uh, the research that you presented is uh, the, the first step of many. Um, and I'm curious about uh, what you think the timeline would look like for for the the future slide, and uh, what might slow down or speed up that timeline? Yeah, so um, with the uh, the future slide that I presented was talking about uh, the the mitochondria uh, project in particular that we're trying to turn into a gene therapy. Um, so what we're trying to do right now in the lab over the next maybe four months, is perfect, uh, we've got it perfected in these human patient cells, but we can't go straight into human patients. Um, the, the, the FDA frowns on that. So we need to uh, find a way to test this in, in animals first. So we've uh, we found a collaborator who has a mouse model, and so we want to be able to do this in mice. So we're hoping over the next uh, few months to perfect it in the mouse cells, uh, and then go into the mice. So uh, then how long is it going to take uh, to get it working in the mice? Um, hopefully two-ish years. And then um, we can start thinking about safety testing in large animals and then going into humans. So you could, you, you could theoretically see you know, therapies based on this kind of thing, and I'm wildly speculating here, 10, 12, 15 years um, going into humans. Now, one, uh, one thing that we don't really work directly on is gene therapy technology itself. Gene therapy technology isn't really approved. Uh, it's in clinical trials. It's in a lot of different clinical trials. It's not approved for general use yet. And so that technology is still being perfected. So um, um, we're, we're relying on that getting uh, perfected and approved and us being able to plug our technology into a gene therapy platform to use. But if it was, you know, maybe you know, by in, in some 
um, compassionate use form, you could see it happening in less than 10 years in, in humans. That's kind of a uh, loose timeline for you for this project. So uh, my understanding is that throughout the evolutionary history, a lot of genes originally from mitochondria or however the first symbiosis bacteria is uh, already migrated to your nucleus. Um, so why did it stop at these 13 genes left? And is it universal? I mean, do mice have exactly these 13 genes left in the mitochondria? And how about like yeast and even plants? Yeah, um, th this is a really, this is a pretty hard question. Um, it, so uh, about a billion or so years ago, the primitive mitochondria fused with our primitive uh, ancestor and formed this symbiotic uh, eukaryotic cell. And that, uh, you know, pre-mitochondria started producing energy for it and they, they, they became symbiotic. They all they each had their, their own genomes, like I mentioned before. Uh, and as the, 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 the question uh, uh, implies, they have drifted over the, uh, over the millennia into the nuclear uh, genome and get incorporated and um, recoded, like I was talking about, that we're doing uh, uh, manually by uh, the evolutionary natural selection process. So um, it, it, it seems to be a continuous process that we've dwindled down, that we've transferred something like a thousand genes uh, now, and we're down to the last 13. Uh, has it stopped? Um, it, it, probably not. Uh, it's, uh, it, it seems to uh, be happening. You can look across um, uh, evolution and in, in different types of organisms, like you were pointing out, and see more primitive organisms that have more uh, uh, of it still in the mitochondria and, uh, and, and organisms like us that are down to uh, these 13, we're actually using that information to inform our, um, our engineering of the mitochondria. When we look at the evolution of how uh, this has happened, we look at what the different challenges that evolution has had to overcome and how it has accomplished that. And we've learned to mimic that by looking at the genes that, say, have come into the nucleus more recently. So, um, uh, yes, mice have the same uh, 13 uh, genes, and no yeast uh, don't have the same ones. There's, there's a lot of relation and, and overlap, uh, and maybe Amuta wants to chime in so in some detail. Uh, organisms, only two genes haven't been transferred to the nucleus, uh, cytosome B and COX-1, that's part of complex B, and uh, so otherwise, at some point, all the other 11 genes have been it should be possible for us to move these genes from the mitochondria to the nucleus. But again, those two genes are tough. We have, we, we have uh, oh. But <clears throat> we're working at it. Yeah. <laughs> Is there any chance that cells that have bad mitochondria are more likely to become cancerous or cause other cells to become cancerous? Yes, uh, it's a complicated story um, that there is, there is a, and it's, it's not something I'm an expert on, but uh, uh, if you wanna learn about this really, really um, uh, complicated field of study, you can look up the Warburg effect. Uh, and uh, th that does show that um, that there's a there's a strong interplay between the, the mitochondria and the, and the nucleus in in cancer. That there's not a simple relation that I can say. You know, if you get this one mutation in mitochondria, that it's going to predispose you to cancer. The same way that that you you can see that in the nuclear genome for certain kinds of genes. You know, famous genes like. You know, BRCA1, which is the breast cancer gene, or P53, telomerase, 
uh, th those are those are famous genes that are you know always activated in cancer. It's it's much more complicated uh, signaling interaction between them, and so we don't we don't we don't know of any simple ways that it would do that. Now now maybe uh, a relevant part of your question would be you know our is our therapy going to help uh, prevent cancer? And you know it, it would be difficult for me to to make too many claims uh, about that, but it it might. It might, if you if you have healthy mitochondria, you're avoiding an awful lot of downstream uh, effects of uh, of sick mitochondria that that could be carcinogenic. Okay, well, thank you for this excellent talk. Thanks so much.